Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneDrop, created for people with diabetes by people who have diabetes. By Gvoke HypoPen, the first pre-mixed auto-injector for very low blood sugar. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, there is so much data when it comes to diabetes that even your doctor would like an easier way to interpret numbers and make dosing recommendations. A new first-of-its-kind technology called DreamMed may help. With the use of your system, I can stop being a technician. I didn't learn to be a mathematical or an engineer. I learned how to be a physician. And I want to continue to go and practice medicine. I don't want to go and practice engineering. That's DreamEd co-founder and CEO Aaron Atlas talking about the reaction he's getting from people who use their system. We'll explain what it's all about and how it could help. In Tell Me Something Good, a big award for a doctor you all may know better as an amazing racer. And I learned the word saccharista in innovations. Let's talk about women and diabetes tech design. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of Diabetes Connections. I'm so glad to have you along. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. We aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection, as well as stories of technology. And, and that's what I'm talking about this week. And I went into this episode, I got to tell you, sort of thinking it would be one thing, because I know many of you are very familiar with the technology and these companies. DreamMed is behind the algorithm that's inside the Medtronic 780G, which was just approved in the U.S. And we actually are talking to Medtronic in our very next episode about that and many other things. But the agreement with Medtronic and DreamMed was, it was done several years ago. And DreamMed While I'm sure very proud of that algorithm, they've moved forward. They've moved on. They wanted to talk about something else. It was very interesting for me to go through this interview, and I I hope you enjoy it as well. For more of the mundane, uh, less technology and more basic, how much more basic can you get with diabetes than insulin? I'll give a quick update at the very end of the show. I had mentioned in a previous show we had some insurance changes. A bunch of you wanted to know how that was going. Hey, yay, insurance changes are always fun. So I will talk more in detail about that at the end of the show. But in terms of insulin, yeah, we're switching types. Don't you love that? We had been on Novolog for many years. And then when Benny was, I want to say about eight or nine, we switched insurance and they switched us to Humalog. And we have been on that ever since. He's 15. And I guess it's time to go back to Novolog. So I'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Luckily, we don't have any issues or haven't had so far. I know a lot of people do. Fingers crossed. So yeah, insurance update and more at the end of the show. (laughs) All right. uh, Interview with the CEO of DreamMed in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneDrop. OneDrop is diabetes management for the 21st century. OneDrop was designed by people with diabetes for people with diabetes. OneDrop's glucose meter looks nothing like a medical device. You've seen this. It is sleek, compact, seamlessly integrates with the award-winning OneDrop mobile app. Sync all your other health apps to OneDrop to keep track of the big picture and easily see health trends. And with a OneDrop subscription, you get unlimited test strips and lancets delivered right to your door. Every OneDrop plan also includes access to your own certified diabetes coach. Have questions but don't feel like waiting for your next doctor visit? Your personal coach is always there to help. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneDrop logo to learn more. My guest this week is the co-founder and CEO of DreamMed, an Israeli company with the slogan, We Treat the Data, You Treat the Person. Aaron Atlas talked to me about everything from their partnership with Medtronic. As I said, they developed the algorithm that's inside the newly approved 780G to their newer technology. And this is all about helping doctors better interpret the data they're getting from CGMs and pumps. He mentions a brand new study on this, comparing their algorithm very favorably to outcomes from Yale and Barbara Davis Diabetes Centers. And I will link that up in the show notes at diabetes-connections.com. I learned a lot from this conversation. I really hope you enjoy it as well. Here's my talk with Aaron Atlas of DreamMed. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me. I am excited to learn more about this. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Tell me just generally, what is DreamMed? What does this mean for the diabetes community? Well, you know, for 
a certain amount of years, um, a lot of effort has been invested on, let's get more accurate glucose measurements. Let's get more continuous glucose measurements. Let's get the, those glucose measurements and insulin measurements being connected. Um, and everybody told us that if we will have more data, more accurate data, more accessible data, all the problems about managing people with diabetes will be solved, right? Because the patient will be more knowledgeable, the providers will be more knowledgeable, we will have the tools to get into a better decision. Now, Dreamit has started as um, a technology team within one of the biggest institutes that treat people with diabetes, type 1 diabetes here in Israel. And what we saw there is that data is not all. And, and sometimes in order to make this analogy, this logic thinking between data and decisions, there is a lot of gap that you need to jump in order to make that move. Um, you need to be um, experienced. You need to know what is important, what is not important. And you need to be able to make the right decision in the right time for the right patient. So what Dreamit is taking on is we would like to take the responsibility of allowing providers and patients to make better decisions about insulin dosing. When we started in 2007, the, the, the holy grail was, okay, let's try to develop these automated insulin delivery algorithm that will make these decisions in real time. And we uh, managed to do a prototype and we published these results that were the first publication in New England Journal of Medicine. And, and finally, after uh, dating several clinical trials, sending people home, we were the first group in the world that sent people home with automated insulin delivery. We licensed that to Medtronic Diabetes, but the, the cohort of people that are going to be using or currently is being using um, automated insulin delivery is pretty small, depending on the amount of people with diabetes type 1, type 2, that needs to make decisions about insulin. So what Dreamit is now focusing is on developing those and commercializing those algorithms that will be able to take all the vast amount of data that's out there and it can be accessible from cloud to cloud, mobile and everything. And how do we get into the most accurate personalized decision about how much insulin a specific person with diabetes need to, to infuse, not just in terms of real time, but more about looking on the treatment plan, how to optimize carb ratios how to optimize basal treatment, how to optimize insulin sensitivity factor. What is the difference between a patient on an insulin pump to a patient that is using multiple daily injections, basal only, different kind of types of injection uh, regimen. That's what Dream It right now to do. So we would like to make sure that we will treat the data so a person with diabetes can continue with his life and a, and, and a provider can start dealing with the person that is in front of them and not just looking into the computer making himself a technician with numbers and decide what data. Aaron, you have heard the podcast, so you know I am easily overwhelmed by data and information. I have, right. I, I listened to everything you said, and here and I'm trying and here's what I heard. We want to make life easier for you. There's too much information that comes your way, even with accurate CGM, even with automated insulin delivery. There's so much data and information that unless you are a numbers person, you know, you may not be able to crunch it yourself. And I know you you mentioned already a lot more down the road, but if I could focus on that, the automated insulin for just a moment and come back to some of the other things. Can you just tell me as I'm listening and please correct me if I'm wrong, Benny, my son is using control IQ with the algorithm that's inside the tandem pump using partnering with Dexcom. Is this sort of that? Is that the first step that you're talking about when you talked about automated insulin? Is it the algorithm that controls the pump and the CGM together? Correct. We started in 2007 building uh, such an algorithm. At, at the time, we called him um, the medical doctor, the MD logic, artificial pancreas. And, and the idea and what is different between the algorithm that we developed back then and the one that you have right now in Control IQ is how do you make this real-time decision about how much insulin to infuse? And, and while uh, uh, Control IQ, as you may know, is using MPC technique, uh, model predictive control, um, and you have that one of Medtronic that uses a different kind of type of, of control. It's coming from the engineering world. We were strong in understanding how physician analyze data. And what we did is we took a technology called Fuzzy Logic. And I don't know if you know what Fuzzy Logic is, but I'm sure you have it in your washing machine. <laughs> and you have it in trains in China and everything. And the idea behind Fuzzy Logic is that, you know what? The world is not one and zero, black and white. There has to be a mathematical way 
to make decisions based on gray areas. And it's pretty much the way that we're thinking as a person. Yeah. So what we took is the way that physicians analyze data, make a decision and automate it using this fuzzy logic. And we developed this automated insulin delivery algorithm. And we tested it when we got the, the, the ability to communicate with Medtronic pumps. And now we have our part, some part of our algorithm is going, is inside the Medtronic 780G that they announced that they got a CE mark for that in June this year. And they're, I'm sure that they're going after the, the FDA. The main difference between what we did and what happened in Control IQ and, and in, in, in Medtronic 670G is the fact that we were the first that played with the changing automatically both the basal and the pulses. Mm. And we had the ability to predict glucose into the future and dose insulin based on the predicted glucose. Um, some of the elements that we, that we have, you have also in Control IQ, and, and I know that Control IQ is working pretty well, but one of the things that we had in that time is the understanding that there's a lot of the sensitivities of the patient that this AID algorithm will need to use. So for example, when you are using your Control IQ, you still need to dose for your meals, right? Yes. So you need to optimize your cover ratios. And, and some of the safety limits are still dependent upon the insulin sensitivity factor of the pump or the open loop basal rate of the pump. Um, so the algorithm is, is like riding on, on that basal rate. So we had a, a, a similar methodology and, and we developed this, what we call today the DreamEd Advisor. It's that algorithm that optimized the, the, the sensitivity factors. So at, back at the time, we had two pieces of our technology. We only licensed one of it to Medtronic. And we continue to develop the other one because we believe that the other one will help a much more larger number of people with diabetes. So tell me about that other one. Where will it be used? Are you talking about people with type 2 or people who use insulin any type? So that's an interesting question. So we, just, we started with an algorithm that basically optimized open loop pump therapy. And we took data from CGM at the beginning and history of pump delivery basically did an automated way what any physician is doing in, in the clinic right now. And we developed that technology. We got, uh, we won a grant from Hemsley Charitable Trust back then in 2015, um, out of 70 applicat, applicants, got $3.5 million to um, evaluate the performance of this algorithm versus doctors from Jocelyn Diabetes Center, um, the School of Medicine in Yale, uh, Barbara Davis in Colorado, University of Florida, and three sites in Europe, with the intention to show that if you are a physician, any, any type of physician that uses our algorithm, you will get into the same clinical outcome as if that patient data was analyzed by doctors from these leading academic diabetes centers. And yesterday, the results of this study were published in Nature Medicine, showing that we are doing the same outcome as expert docs. And if you can think about it, 60% of the cohort with type 1 diabetes, the adults one, are being treated by primary cares. Yeah. What we can do to the, to the glucose control of these patients, if we will equip those primary cares with a technology that helps them analyze data and get the same performance as special endocrinologists. What we can do to the touch point of changing the insulin treatment plan of a patient if instead of the patient will need to wait three, four, six, eight months to see his endo, we'll have some sort of a virtual place that he can send the data and share the data with the algorithm. The algorithm will make all the calculation and recommend how to change the insulin dosage or the insulin treatment plan of that patient. So that was the, the, what we did so far. And, and when we approach FDA with that, um, FDA didn't know how to, to regulate such a device yeah. because there was no predicate to what we offer to FDA to do. So what we managed to do with a very strong partnership with the FDA team is to decide that we will regulate this device as a new product. So in 2018, we got FDA clearance um, based on 510K de novo. So we are the first in the US system that regulated a product that an algorithm can take continuous glucose sensor data and make recommendations to our healthcare providers how to optimize insulin treatment for a patient. So I'm trying to break it down because that does sound like such a useful tool. I'm an adult with type 1. I'm seeing a general practitioner who may not know the nuances of treatment. They take my CGM data. 
They take my dosing data, either I'm assuming either from a pump or from MDI. They send it Correct. to your service. The care provider, the doctor then gets the data back and can give the patient advice based on your technology using the expertise and, you know, from the algorithm. And that new study said that advice is comparable to Yale and Barbara Davis and all the places that you indicated. Did I get that right? Exactly. Right back to Aaron in just a moment. And he's going to be explaining their agreements with other diabetes groups like Gluco and Tidepool. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And do you know about Dexcom Clarity? It's their diabetes management software. And for a long time, I just thought it was something our endo used. But you can use it on both the desktop or as an app on your phone. It's an easy way to keep track of the big picture. I try to check it about once a week. It really helps Benny and me dial back and see longer term trends and help us not to overreact to what happened for just one day or even just one hour. The overlay reports help put context to Benny's glucose levels and patterns. You can even share the reports with your care team, which makes appointments a lot more productive. Managing diabetes is not easy, but I feel like we have one of the very best CGM systems working for us. Find out more at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Now back to my interview with Aaron Atlas and DreamMed. And the way that the data is being flowing in, so we sign a data partnership with Gluco, with Dexcom, with Tightpool. We have our own platform. So, so the patient can download the data at home. It doesn't have to get physically to see the provider, which is super important, especially now with the COVID-19 issues. And then the data is coming to our system. All that the provider needs to do is just push a button, request a recommendation. He will get that recommendation. It doesn't going to get, you know, blur the things, you know, Please consider looking on. No, he will get exact numbers. He, the, the algorithm will tell them, listen, at 6 a.m., change the carb ratio of that specific patient from 1 to 15 to 1 to 10. Exact numbers. All right. I have two questions from a very practical point of view. I'm curious if you've run into a provider who says, I can do this better. I don't need this. Sure, I don't know the difference between Lantus and Traceba. I'm a general practitioner. But why do I need something like this? Have you run into resistance from providers or are they, I could see the flip side, thank goodness for taking this off my hands because I don't have the time to learn all of this. So there are, there are two types of providers. So first of all, the, the, the approval that we have right now, the clearance that we have right now with FDA is just for type 1 people on insulin pump. We are pursuing the expansion of the indicator for use for the injection cohort and with the intention to submit that by the end of the year. But in the study that we did, and, and, and right now we are de we already deployed the system in several clinics around the, the U.S. You know, we are in, in Stanford University, University of Florida, New York University, Texas Children, Cincinnati Children. So we are we already deployed. Have all, already more than one thousand people that that use the technology. And so what we heard from them is a couple of things. So number one, at the beginning they curious, they want to check, they want to make sure that we didn't make any any false recommendations. Um, and they're not agreeing 100% with anything that we are recommending. So we always allow them to edit. If there's anything that they would like to edit, they can edit it before they share it with the patient. But as time goes on um, and they build in their confidence with the system, they are relying on the system and they're really feeling how they help them. So for example, Dr. Forlenza, Greg Forlenza from Barbara Davis said, you know what, with the use of your system, I can stop being a technician. I didn't learn to be in a mathematical or an engineer. I learned how to be a physician and I wanted to continue to go and practice medicine. I don't want to go and practice engineering. So this is one of the feedbacks. And I think that when we'll go to the mass uh, numbers of providers, there will be different kinds of providers. Some of them will be uh, um, resistance, but I think that once they will see the clinical benefit and the response of their patients, I think that they will endorse that uh, and it will build their confidence with it. Great. I love that, that he doesn't want to be an engineer. He wants to be a physician. We should all be so lucky to have a doctor who wants to do that. My other question on this, and I'm, I'm apologizing to throw things at you to mess up this system, but the first thing I thought of was somebody like my son, who's a, a not an unbiased person, but he's a great kid. He is not a perfect diabetes person. Perfect example that I think would mess up your algorithm. This morning, he had, I don't even know, coffee, hot chocolate, a glass of juice. I don't know what he had, but he had something as he's going to virtual school to, he's, he's right down the hall from me, so I could go ask him. But I can see that his blood sugar has already gone up to 140. 
it'll drift back down thanks to Control IQ. I don't know if he bolused for that drink, if or if he bolused after. What does the algorithm do when people aren't, quote, perfect diabetics? Because you can adjust the carb ratio and the basal rate all you want, but most people with type 1 aren't automatons who are going to fit an algorithm. Well, that's an excellent question. I think that at the end, if you are creating something for the use of people, you have to understand that nobody is perfect. And you have to make sure that the recommendation that you are providing will be right on the spot because otherwise it could cause uh, safety issues. So what we are doing, when we are taking the data, number one that we are doing, we are trying to split that data into events and understand, okay, that's a meal event, that's a bolus event, that is events that, that usually the basil could make an influence because there is no bolus or meal be, uh, uh, before or afterwards. We also uh, apply different kinds of, of techniques to automatically detect places where the patient ate and didn't bolus for that or didn't report and didn't use his calculator in order to calculate the amount of insulin. And, and then for each one of the events, we are trying to ask, the algorithm is asking himself, okay, is it an issue of dosing problem or is it an issue of behavioral problem? Do we see the high glucose post to meal because the carb ratio is, is wrong? or because the patient just delivered his bolus 15, 20 minutes after the meal, and there's no way that the glucose could be down. So we are, from our experience, because we are so much integrated with doctors that understand data, and because, you know, I'm here since 2007, is, is closing my 14th year in February, we know so much about people with diabetes, how they behave. So we program the algorithm in that way, so the recommendation that we are delivering is on the spot. If we are saying that we don't have enough events that apply on changing in dosing, we will not issue that. We can personalize even the, the behavioral messages and calculate what is the most important behavioral that will improve the timing range. And we're not issuing 20 types of behavioral <laughs> messages, blurred behavioral messages, no. We're issuing no more than three and we are very specific. So if we're seeing something that happened specifically on the breakfast of Benny, we will tell and listen, Benny, please pay attention on breakfast, deliver the insulin 10 minutes before the meal, because that's what, 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 what makes your entire day being hot. Or if we're seeing that when he has an hypo, he just eat whatever he finds in the refrigerator, and we see it from, from the dynamics, we're trying to teach him how to compensate for a hypo in a better way. It's absolutely fascinating. I think that's tremendous that you're building in the behavior as well, and you can really account for it. Back to the automated systems. And forgive me, Aaron, you used a term open loop rather than closed loop. And pardon my ignorance. Right. Can you explain what that is? Sure. So open loop is what we call uh, using um, pump therapy with CGM or with uh, self-management blood glucose meters without an AID system. So now, some people call it um, sensor augmented pump therapy. Some people say just uh, a regular insulin pump therapy. Uh, um, some people say it's open loop. There is no algorithm that close the loop in real time and command in real time how much insulin to infuse on an insulin pump based on CGM data. Okay. If we could go back to the algorithm that is more closed loop and kind of looking ahead for what you're planning on that, we've already talked about mealtime boluses and how challenging they are for people, whether it's estimating correctly or remembering to do them or doing them late. What's your plan for that? I know there are a few AI systems that are looking to try to do away with the manual mealtime bolus. Is that in the cards here? So for us, is is not on the cards at the moment. I think that what we are trying to look is is beyond the AID system. Is is, is how to help those with type two on insulin. How to help those on injections. Because think about it. A couple of years ago, nobody knew what's going on with people that still do injections. Right? None of them use CGM. You didn't know what's going on with the injections because they didn't record that or they just cheat cheating and when they sat in, in the reception area of the clinic, they took a piece of paper and, and tried to make lottery on when they did they you know, those doors their insulin. Now these data is being available thanks to the hard work that Dexcom, uh, you know, Abbott, Medtronic is doing on the CGM space, um, and companies like Company Medical and others that are doing it on connected uh, pen and, and we know other efforts of other companies, you know, Novo is doing that, Lily's doing that. So 
all of a sudden, the, 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 the same problem that we had a couple of years ago with people on CGM and pumps for the type one persons and the providers and the amount of data, we're now going to have it in a much, much broader population. You have about 12 million people that dose insulin in the US, but only 1 million of them are on pumps mm. with type one. So the question is, what are you going to do with these 11 million people? And that's where our focus on, that's number one. Another focus that we are looking at is going into contextual data. And how can we know and combine the fact that we can know where you are from your personal life in terms of, you know, if you are driving or you are walking or you are going into a restaurant and how to combine that information with the glucose data and what predictive real-time notification we can give you in order to improve that and the glucose control. All right, wait, 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 so wait. wait. You're going to know where I'm driving. I'm walking to a restaurant. Wait a minute. Back up. Are you in my, this is something in my phone or are you using cell data? That's easy. You know, when you're driving, do you have a Bluetooth in the car? Yes. So the phone knows that you are connected to the Bluetooth of the car, right? Yes. <laughs> so for example, if you will give the permission, other application will be, have the knowledge that you are driving. Are, are you using navigation software? Uh, yes, you know, you have to laugh, Aaron. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt your train of thought here, but for some reason, I just thought of the Pokemon Go app from a couple of years ago because it knew when my kids were in the car and not walking, right? I mean, I, I know I sound, you're, you're probably laughing because I sound so ignorant with this stuff. But yeah, with our cell phones, I'm sure that everybody knows where we are at all times. It's amazing. That's right. And, and, but I think, again, so I, I'm not talking about, you know, poking your privacy and everything. And, and it's have to be on a certain things that, that the user will need to authorize sure. uh, for the benefit of the user. But, but potentially, Benny will learn driving. It will go do his driving license. I'm sure that nobody wants a person with diabetes that his glucose is going down or predicted to be down in the next 30 minutes to start driving. So would it give, uh, in your system, would it then give a reminder? Um, you know, I'm walking into a restaurant, time to bolus. Is that what you're envisioning? So again, your glucose is dropping in the next 30 minutes. If it, Please take something before you start to drive. Or we're seeing that you're going into a restaurant and your, goose, your glucose is sky high or going high in a high trend. Please correct your glucose now before start eating because then it will be much more difficult to correct your glucose. These are the types of things that, you know, examples of how you take context and combine it together with glucose and insulin data. It's so interesting to me because I think, especially with the type 2 community who use insulin, it's a very different world than the type 1 community where most people, well, I'm, I'm biased because my podcast audience is so well educated, but people are thinking about it so much more often. I have lots of friends with type 2 who dose insulin who don't really think about it, who don't really know just because they're, as you said, they're seeing a general practitioner. They're not as educated. It's not a, a, it's not a personality flaw. And I could see where this would be so helpful, just these reminders. With people with type 2, have you already learned any nuances of how they want to use this kind of system? Is it different than people with type 1? So I think that within the type two population is very much dependent when they are on multiple daily injection mm -hmm. therapy or they are just doing basal only. So that's one big difference that between type two and type one. Another big difference is, yeah, like you said, they're thinking about the condition differently. They are denying the fact they have a condition. I think that's much stronger than people with type one, especially teenagers with type one that, you know, try to break the system and try to see what's going on. But still, you need to, to find other ways to do that. And we're still studying it. What is the best way to deliver that to, to people that have type 2 diabetes? Um, and that's why initially we're focusing on their providers and try to better understand what people that treat people with type 1 diabetes would like to see, how we can help the providers provide a better treatment for them. That will be our first step. Then when we will get these endorsement and understanding about the actual users uh, will be much more comfortable to, to offer something that will go directly to the user. Because as you said, truly, it's a different population. I remember years ago, there was a big push. And I, I know you were, you were around if you started in the mid-2000s. There was this big push to almost gamify type 1 diabetes, right? With apps that kind of gave you rewards for checking, or here's a, a game that would help kids learn, or even adults 
And it turned out that most people didn't want to think that much about it. They just wanted the system to take care of it. Like, stop reminding me to log, stop reminding me to dose, handle it. Talk to me about how DreamMed will do that, even though you are talking about reminders. Because I think that the, the difference between the reminders that are in the market, that used to be in the market, and what I'm trying to talk about is that those reminders were based on general time frame. So for example, you know, you are logging into the app that you need to take your basal insulin between 7 and 9 a.m. And, and now it doesn't matter if, if you are going just to going to deliver that, there will be some sort of mechanism to just ping that, that reminder to you and will drive you crazy, right? <laughs> I think that what DreamIt is trying to do is a couple of things. Number one, we're not just giving a regular reminders. We're giving actionable reminders. So if we will tell you to do something, it's because this is the right time for you to do this action. And then number two, we are trying to take off the burden of treating the diabetes, you know, taking the burden off thinking about your glucose and thinking about what you need to do right now. For people that use AID system, this is exactly what AID give them, you know? You know that there is something that looks on your glucose on a regular basis, every five minutes, analyze the situation and provide your, uh, uh, the actual dosing. But on people with, with multiple daily injections, they're not using pumps. So there is the only way to make the insulin injected is to make some sort of a partnership with the user. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create all the mechanisms that will bring this partnership between the person with diabetes on the injections and, and the algorithms. Uh, we're trying to make sure that wherever we are issuing some sort of a reminder, it will be an actionable one. And, and hopefully it will be within a certain time frame that the user is willing to accept such a reminder. Because for example, if you're driving and then the system is shouting out, give insulin right now, there is no way that you're going to give that insulin, right? Because right now you're driving. But, but if, if we're able to capture the exact moment that you're open to get that reminder, and this, it's an actionable reminder, it's not a general one, I hope that people with diabetes will find it useful. And I think that's the thing that we are trying to learn together with the community and together with, with personally diabetes that work for us. Because at the end, it's a partnership between the person, the provider, and the industry. And that's what we're trying to create. It's important for people to know that there are companies that are not in the U.S. that might be a little bit small, but they are trying to make a difference for you. And I hope that together with what we're trying to do and what the community is trying to do, and with our partnership, we really, really be able to make that difference because the culture of, of DreamEd is coming from a clinic. It's a company that the importance of making lives better is on our culture. Another thing in our culture is to make sure that whatever we're issuing has a clinical benefit. We're just not, not just want to have a cool product and just get more money. And I really, really optimistic about the, the impact that we can do on people with diabetes. And we're committed to do that. Aaron, before I let you go, do you mind if I ask about the population with type 1 in Israel? Sure. I'm trying to think. I know in Scandinavian countries, it's very high. So it's debatable, but it's between 30 to 50K people with type 1 diabetes in Israel. This is it. But we don't have a lot of people with type 1 diabetes. If you're looking on the PEDS, all the PEDS are being treated by, um, you know, academic centers, big hospital clinics. The, the clinic that I'm coming from is pretty much treating a very large portion of, of, this, uh, of the PEDS. And, and adults are usually go in the same way, either to a, um, a specialist, uh, but the, most of them are going into to primary care. We're very techy. We have a lot of a lot of people on CGM and insulin pump. Uh, we currently don't have control IQ in Israel. It's not approved. So, um, and 670G is not reimbursed. So the majority of the cohort here in Israel are on regular pump and CGM. This is it. Well, as I said before we started taping, my son is planning a long trip to Israel next summer. So. I may be knocking at your door if I need anything or just some handholding. I will be happy to. I will be happy to. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I, can, I can vouch for that. Iran, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me and explaining all this. I really appreciate it. I hope we can talk again soon. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information, of course 
that's in the show notes. Just go to diabetes-connections.com. And every show has um, show notes, we call them. I call it an episode homepage as well, because not every podcast player supports the amount of stuff I put in there. Um, Every episode this year has a transcript. Every episode ever has links. And so sometimes if you go to Apple Podcast or if you listen on, you know, Stitcher or Pandora or wherever you listen, and we are everywhere right now, they don't support the links. So if you're ever curious or you can't get to something, just go to the homepage and find the episode. There's a very robust search because we're up to 325 episodes. So I wanted to make it easy for you to find what you were looking for. But when you do that, you can find more information about DreamEd. And I, I linked up the study as well that he mentioned comparing their algorithm to you know doctors at Yale, that sort of thing. You know, I'm curious as you listen what you think about something like this. I feel like this podcast audience is so involved in their numbers in a way that most people in diabetes land uh, are not. I mean, let's face it, there's very few people who are interested in DIY stuff like this audience is. I mean, I know you guys, you're very technical. You're very involved, even if you're listening, saying, hey, that's not me. The very fact that you're listening to a podcast about diabetes puts you in a different educational plane than, you know, 90, 95 percent, let's say, of all people with all types of diabetes, which is not a knock on them. It's just the reality of diabetes and education. So I'm really curious to see how this can help, because as he's saying, you have a general practitioner who's treating people, who's dosing insulin, right? They're giving the prescriptions out. And an algorithm like this can make it so much more precise and safe for the people who are getting those recommendations from these doctors who, you know, might really want to do good, but do not have the experience and the education in endocrinology. So that's my stand on it. We'll see what happens. I'd love to know what you think. All right. Innovations coming up in just a moment. And I want to share this article I found about women in diabetes device design. But first... Diabetes Connections is brought to you by a new sponsor this week. I am so excited to welcome Gvoke Hypopen. You know, almost everyone who takes insulin has experienced a low blood sugar, and that can be scary. A very low blood sugar is really scary, and that's where Gvoke Hypopen comes in. Gvoke is the first auto injector to treat very low blood sugar. Gvoke Hypopen is premixed and ready to go with no visible needle. That means it's easy to use. How easy is it? You pull off the red cap and push the yellow end onto bare skin and hold it for five seconds. That's it. Find out more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Gvoke logo. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with pheochromocytoma or insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk. Saw a great article that I wanted to pass along to you from the wonderful folks at Diabetes Mine. And the headline on this is, Where Are the Women? in diabetes device design. And I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. I will link it up. But the question here was all about, are the shortcomings of diabetes technology a result of just the the functional design requirements, the way it has to be made? Or could it be related to the fact that there aren't enough women in the medical technology design field? They did a whole survey about, you know, wearing this stuff and, you know, where to attach it, how to put it, you know, dresses, things like that. Which, you know, at first listen may sound kind of silly, but when you think about it, wearing the device, the comfort of wearing the device, the mental stress about wearing the device, these are so incredibly important because people with diabetes, men and women, as you know, wear this stuff 24-7. And when you think about the difference between something that is clunky, that looks outdated, that, you know, just doesn't feel right in your hand. I mean, these things make a big difference in terms of how... I hate to use the word compliant, right? But, you know, how well we use them, how much we use them, how comfortable we are with them. In addition to focusing on the pump companies, and in particular Omnipod, very, very interesting take on women who work at Omnipod there. They also focus on women-designed accessories for diabetes tech. Because when you think about it, and they list all of these companies, you know, we've talked about a bunch of them in the past, uh, Myabetic and Funky Pumpers, Spy Belt, Tally Gear. Pump Peels, one of my book to clinic sponsors. Thank you very much, Pump Peels. These are all founded by women because they saw the need and wanted to make life easier and better. So I'll link that up. I really thought it was a great look at a topic that we hadn't thought a lot about before. We focus a lot on, well, patients need to be involved, people with diabetes who actually wear the gear need to be involved. But what about people who wear the gear differently and have different expectations? 
And that and by that, I mean women. My daughter, when she was in high school, wrote a whole paper on pocket equality and did hard research into why women's clothing doesn't have pockets and rarely has pockets that are big enough. I mean, my son puts his phone and his pump and I don't know, you know, a lunchbox in his pocket. I mean, he can fit everything in there. He doesn't think twice about it. But sometimes I think about where the heck would I put a pump if I was wearing what I'm wearing today, right? I don't have any pockets. Really interesting discussion and hats off to Diabetes Mind for focusing on that. Innovations is also your chance to share hacks and tips and tricks that work for you. You know, just little things that make life better with diabetes. So you can post in the Facebook group or you can email me, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com. In Tell Me Something Good this week, a big award for a familiar face around here. Most of you remember Dr. Nat Strand from The Amazing Race. She was the in the team of Nat and Kat, and that was The Amazing Race 17, which I can't believe was 10 years ago. We talked to Dr. Strand earlier this year about working as a physician during this time of COVID and how she was treating her patients. She treats patients with chronic pain and that sort of thing. And we're talking about her on Tell Me Something Good because she is the inaugural winner of the Lisa Stearns Legacy Diversity Award from the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience. So congratulations, Dr. Strand. Of course, the ceremony was virtual, but you can follow her on Twitter and see the pictures and see what all the nice things people are saying about her. And I will link up her Twitter account if you don't follow her already. Also in Tell Me Something Good, something that popped up in my local group. Brian shared a post about his daughter, Emerson, about diabetes and soccer, and he said I could share it. And it's, it's actually a story about her. It's a story by her. It is Emerson's soccerista story, Playing with Diabetes. And this is a column that Emerson wrote that is published on the Girls Soccer Network. I would really urge you to read it, especially if you have a child who is a high-performing or wants to be a high-performing or elite athlete. She talks about no days off. And how, while, you know, I'm sure your mind went to diabetes, that was her mantra in terms of sports. And it has really helped her, she says, deal with soccer and with diabetes. I'm not going to read her words here. I I just think it's a great column. I would urge you to read it. I'll link it up on the episode homepage, and I'm going to put it in the Diabetes Connections Facebook group as well. Well done, Emerson. Really great to see the incredible hard work that it looks like you've been putting in. And what a wonderful column as well. So thank you so much, Brian, for sharing that and for letting me talk about it a little bit here. If you have a tell me something good story, it could be a birthday, a diversary, you know, your child is published in a national print publication, you know, anything you want to focus on that is good news in the diabetes community, please reach out and let me know. Just tell me something good. Tell me something annoying could be the name of this segment. I just want to talk a little bit about our insurance changes, mostly to commiserate with with many of you who have gone through this. So as I said at the top of the show, our biggest change is now that they're going to switch insulin on us. Um, You know, I talked to Benny about this. We are so fortunate to have a, frankly, a pretty good stockpile of insulin that we've built up. If you followed the show for a long time, you know that I've I've discussed his insulin needs went way up um, and they have gone back down to almost pre-puberty levels. But we never changed the prescription. So, you know, I have, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, I have shared insulin uh, in the Charlotte area with adults in need. Uh, We have some great local groups, and uh, it is ridiculous that we need to to do this, but we we do share with each other, and I've been happy to help out on that. But we are basically out of pens, and I like to use pens as a backup. And Benny likes to have them for flexibility. You know, he'll take them sometimes, and if something's wonky with his pump, he knows he can give himself a shot, that sort of thing. But I hate the idea of changing insulins, right? Everything's cooking right now. Everything's chugging along really well. I don't want to rock the boat, but I also don't want to pay $300 for a pen. So I'm going to be talking to our endocrinologist. Benny has an appointment in two weeks as I'm taping, probably more like a week and a half as you listen. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about it then. Maybe he has some samples. But most likely we will be switching and we did not have an issue when we switched in the past. So I have fingers crossed that it will be fine. It'll be fine. But God, that is annoying. And I know I don't feel like appealing and fighting if we don't need to. It's it's possible that Novolog will work just as well for him. So let's at least find out and we'll go from there. The other issue was, of course, that we are now dealing with Edge Park. And I will spare you all of the details, but I tried to do a workaround and I'm laughing because I should know better by now. I tried to get the Dexcom prescription 
to stay at our pharmacy because, man, we've been filling it at the pharmacy for the last couple of years. And if you have already been able to do that, you know it's like a dream. At least it is for us. It may take an extra day to get it, but it's a day. It's not like they're mailing it out for you and it takes three weeks. It's been wonderful. And I just had an auto refill and it's been great. But Edge Park told me, we don't fill to your pharmacy. You only can do it mail order. Well, I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to be caught short. So I let Edge Park go ahead and fill the order. But then I did some you know, detective work and I kept calling and talking to people because what else do I have to do but be on the phone with these people? And I finally got someone at my insurance company to admit they would fill it at the pharmacy. But here's what she said. She said, well, we don't like you to go to the pharmacy because they don't often have it in stock. And I said, come on, you know, that's not true. They can fill it in a day. They've been filling it for four years. And she said, okay, well, you can, you do have a pharmacy benefit and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I hung up the phone and I will fill it at the pharmacy next time. I already have the order from Edge Park through the mail. And I thought, you know, that's just because my insurance company has a deal with Edge Park. That's all that is. She's trying to discourage me from going to the pharmacy because that's their business. I get it. But how stupid is that? How outrageous is that? Ugh! Now you know why I saved it to the end of the show. All right. I will keep you posted on our many adventures as this moves forward because up next, I have to fill Benny's tandem pump supplies. And we've never been able to do that at the pharmacy. So I'm sure it'll be more adventures with Edge Park, my new pals. Ah, oh, goodness gracious. All right. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan, for audio editing solutions. Thank you. If you are still here listening to me rant, I love you. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>